Have you ever considered storing large binary files in your Git repositories? It's not necessarily a proven pattern, with some advising against it. There are times where you may want to do this though, for example, for my podcast cloudwithchris.com to store my podcast files. Let's start off by creating a sample repository. We'll take the usual first step of initializing the repository. Then we need to create a file and we'll edit that in VS Code. After making some changes, we'll save it to the local file system. As usual, we need to add the files to our staging environment, or in other words, prepare the files to be added to the Git history. And then we need to commit those files, so actually taking the step to add them to the versioned repository. We can't push it anywhere because we don't have a remote repository. So let's go ahead and create a brand new repository on GitHub. We can copy the quick setup steps to push an existing Git repository to GitHub. And after pushing to GitHub, we can refresh the browser and see that our file is there. I'm going to copy an MP3 file to my local file system. When we run git status, we see that we need to stage and commit the changes just like any other file. But we have a problem. This file is going to be stored directly in our git repository, so will always remain a part of the git history. As git is a decentralized version control system, Every developer has to have the full repository history on their own system. That means any time a user clones the repo, they have to download these large MP3 files. As the number of these large files increases, the problem becomes more frustrating. We can see that there is an MP3 file now stored directly in our repository, which is not what we want. This is where Git LFS can help us. How do we use Git LFS? First, we'll need to get the binaries on our machine. The instructions to do this may differ for your environment, so check the Git LFS documentation for setup steps. Our first step is running Git LFS install. This is a one-time command to be run on the system. When we run that in the command line, we can see that Git LFS has now been initialized for our environment. Next up, we'll need to run the git lfs track command in each repository that we want to use git lfs. This effectively tells git lfs which sets of files it should be managing and which are handled as usual by git. As we've uploaded an mp3 file, we'll use git lfs track star.mp3. Now, when we use git status, we see that a .git attributes file has been added. And that's it. There is no specific change for our step three as we just use the usual add and commit process that we used to when using Git. Git and Git LFS are intelligent enough to do the necessary bits for us at this point. Notice though that when running Git status, the MP3 file has been modified. We're going to stage the files and commit them to the repository. Once complete, we'll push them to the remote Git repository. Now, when we look at test.mp3, we can see that it is stored with Git LFS. But what does that actually mean? Well, as we go ahead and change directories in a moment and clone the remote Git repository, we will use Git clone as normal first off. What you'll see is that this brings down the mp3 files as it does normally with git. But when we use git clone and add the dash dash config lfs.fetch exclude flag, we can specify that we want specific mp3 files excluded, or all mp3 files. Now when we do this and inspect the mp3 file, we can see the file is much smaller. And when looking at the file contents, we can see that there are three properties in this text file, a version, an ID, and size. This file is effectively a pointer, which helps Git LFS identify where the actual file is so that when you want to pull the file to your local repository. And that is the magic behind Git LFS. <laughs>